idea you'll find in in uh, Western esotericism right through. I mean, it's what it, you could call it being a master mason, which just means being a, a man who's in charge of himself, who's got his being under under uh, un, under a degree of discipline and control, and uh, but at the same time becomes a fountain of, of new things, or what you call the genius, or which is that aspect of us which is on the other side of the material uh, world which we're faced with through our senses. So it's extrasensory, extrasensory being. The genius in the old days, genius simply meant the, uh, the, 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 the other word was the daimon, which is a kind of being which is also our, in some sense ourselves, or we are a kind of projection of that being into three dimensions. And it's being in touch with that side. That's where the great inspiration or inspiriting comes from. And so it's precisely that, it's to find your genius. Your, your genius. Now we've, today, this idea of the genius is very confusing because it may, seems to mean two things. One is it's somebody with a tremendous gift for mathematics or playing the piano, uh, what used to be called a prodigy. Somebody was prodigiously gifted with a skill, we'd say they're a genius at it. Uh, okay. And the other meaning of genius would be, oh, somebody who creates an original film, the like of which people think has never been seen before. They say, oh, that's a genius. Or somebody says, oh, he paints like, or she paints like, no one ever painted before and a genius. This is, these are just exaggerated uh, um, terms for somebody who's, who's gifted. Uh, but the genius in, 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 in spiritual terms is the divine aspect of being and uh, the ultimate flame. And the aim, the aim of uh, Bath is to, is to be more of that than you thought you were capable of being. Um, God is that, it, God is that being of us that we don't know, you know, or uh, are out of touch with. We've lost this divine image in in being in the world. Mysticism is the sizzling wires, like lovely freehand. They curve for miles east <clears throat> and miles west, sagging under their burden of swallows. We were small and thought we knew nothing worth knowing. We thought words travelled the wires in the shiny pouches of raindrops, each one seeded full with the light of the sky, the gleam of the lines, and ourselves so infinitesimally scaled we could stream through the eye of a needle. This is called a sofa in the 40s. Or a children playing. Playing at being a train. All of us on the sofa in a line behind each other, eldest down to youngest, elbows going like pistons, for this was a train. And between the jam wall and the bedroom door, our speed and distance were inestimable. First we shunted, then we whistled, then somebody collected the invisible for tickets and very gravely punched it, as carriage after carriage under us moved faster. The sofa legs went giddy, and the unreachable ones, far out on the kitchen floor, began to wave. Ghost train, death gondola, the carved curved ends, black leatherette and ornate gauntness of it made it seem the sofa had achieved flotation. Its ballerina casters, its braid and fluent backboard gave it airs of superannuated pageantry. When visitors endured it straight backed when it stood off in its own remoteness, when the insufficient toys appeared on it on Christmas morning, it held out as itself, potentially heaven-bound, earth-bound for sure, among things that might add up or let you down. We occupied our seats with all our might, fit for the uncomfortableness. Constancy was its own reward already. Out in front, on the big upholstered arm, somebody craned to the side, driver or fireman, wiping his dry forehead 
with the air of one who had run the gauntlet. We were the last thing on his mind, it seemed. We sensed a tunnel coming up where we'd pour through like unlit carriages through fields at night. Our only job to sit, eyes straight ahead, and be transported and make engine noise. Um, being transported, uh, well, once again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a lovely word in English. It has a sense of practical public transport, but it has this, it has this earthy horizontal move to transport, but it has a kind of vertical takeoff uh, aspect to, to be transported and carried away, to be glamoured into somewhere else. And I suppose that's the double take of, uh, of poetry or of any art form that it, you want it to be true to here and true to there. And um, so that's, uh, the activity really is a matter of setting the imagined against the endured, I guess, and uh, hoping that the imagined measures up, takes the strain, keeps the balance even. Um, so, I mean, in the poetry, I'm not talking about my own poetry particularly, but in the poetry that, that does transport one, the, other, the poetry of others and the poetry of which they can meet the other. You do have a sense of homecoming and of expedition at the same time, taking off and coming home at once. And uh, I think those, the, the, the experiences which, or the images that lead to poems, do have that uh, sense for the, uh, the poem maker in the beginning, a sense of coming to rest and at the same time getting through. The minute you arrive, you're off, so to speak. And uh, I had this, uh, Robert was mentioning the, the bog bodies and the, uh, the, uh, the book by P.V. Globe. I had that exactly that feeling of, of uh, perfect touchdown at home with them and at the same time uh, buoyancy. So this is a poem about the fir uh, one of those very entrancing photographs of the most famous, perhaps, of these bog corpses, 